All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining United Spinal Greater Philadelphia's chapter for our monthly educational webinar series. We are very excited to have Trisha Hicks with us this evening to just discuss sexuality. Trisha Hicks is a licensed social worker working as a case manager and sexuality educator and therapist at McGee Rehab Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She graduated from Widener University with a master's degree in social work and a master's degree in human sexuality education. At McGee, she oversees the sexuality task force, runs a sexuality education and support group, and provides individual and couples counseling for current and former patients. She has presented at several national and international conferences on sexuality and disability, including the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors and Therapists, Academy of Spinal Cord Injury Professionals, Association of Rehab Nurses, Traumatic Brain Injury Consumer Conference, and Philadelphia Corporation for the Aging's Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program. She has published several chapters on sexuality and disability, and Trisha is also on the editorial board for the Sexuality and Disability Journal. We're very excited to have her here with us this evening. We would also like to thank New Motion Foundation for their sponsorship of tonight's webinar. So New Motion Foundation's mission is to support people and causes that work towards enhancing the lives of people with disabilities in communities of common interest. And their vision is to engage both employees and supporters to donate funds and provide a centralized, coordinated and compliant gateway for distributions on behalf of New Motion to advocacy groups, policy influencers, and charitable programs. You can learn more about New Motion Foundation. I'll be providing their website link in the chat. But now I would like to introduce Trisha Hicks to start off our webinar. Hi everyone. Um, so thank you so much for joining me. I'm gonna share my screen here. All right. Can you guys see that? Was that in the full mode? Good. Okay, wonderful. So hi, everyone. Um, I am super excited to be here. Um, thank you for that very long introduction. I always feel so awkward when people read that stuff. Um, and so I am happy to be here. So what I'd like to do, I mean, I know you guys saw the slide, we're going to talk a little bit about sex. Uh, we're going to talk a lot, actually, about sex. Um, and then what I'd like to do is I'll leave probably about 10, 15 minutes at the end um, that if you guys have any specific questions or if you guys want links for anything, we can sort of pull some of that stuff up. Um, all right. So first, I always like to start with this. This is like one of my favorite little clips, and it's the birds and the bees saying, we do what? Um, and I think really for me, this highlights how sort of taboo sometimes sexuality can be. I feel like Many people that I talk to have rarely ever spoken with anyone um, about sex um, or had anybody even introduce it to them. And I feel like particularly with um, working with a lot of medical professional professionals and healthcare providers, oftentimes healthcare providers are even afraid to bring up sex. And so I feel like it's something that's very important to a lot of people. I feel like it's important enough to you guys for you guys to join us tonight. Um, and so I really like to to talk about it because I feel like that sort of destigmatizes it a little bit. It's a normal part of everyday life. Let's talk about it. Um, the other thing of what I have found is that for many people that I have met, um, ne many of them never got any type of education around sexuality following their injuries um, or related to their injuries. And so I find sometimes it was like, oh, I was given a pamphlet. I was given a book. I was given this, but like Nobody ever really talked to me about this. And I feel like sometimes it's really helpful to have somebody to sort of talk to, to answer any questions that people have. So we're gonna go through a bunch of general stuff um, just related to spinal cord injuries and sexuality. Um, I have a bunch of toys here that I will demonstrate and will not really demonstrate, but I'll show you guys. Um, and then I'll answer, you know, we'll go through some other resources and I'll answer any questions that anybody has. Um, so one of the things that I like to always start with, and this, I'll be very brief on this, this is really to give you guys an idea of the way that 
I think about and conceptualize sexuality when I'm talking about it. So I think many times when people think of sexuality, they often think of like just having sex. Um, and for me, I feel like sex is so much more than just the act of having sex. Um, and so I'd like you guys to know that like this, these are the things and the topics and the areas that I'm considering when I think about sex. I think about it very holistically. Um, and so that's sort of sensuality, which is sort of your comfort in your own body and enjoying your own body. Intimacy is sort of being able to share yourself with someone else. Sexual identity of like who you are as an individual, both what you like, what you don't like, who you're attracted to. Um, sexual health and reproduction, which if I'm being honest, is probably the only area of sexuality that most healthcare providers get education on. Um, sexualization, which is sort of the, the dark underbelly side of sex, which is things that like abuse, um, incest, rape, harassment, those are the types of things that fall under that. Um, and then also looking at social and cultural contexts in thinking about sexuality and how those can differ based on different um, societies and different cultures. Um, the other model that I sort of fuse with this is more of a model that looks at sexuality and disability specifically. So there's two models or, or three models are both very similar. So there's Bancroft's model and then the Sanders and Tepper model. In these, the, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, the primary and the direct sort of align with each other, indirect and secondary lineup. And then iatrogenic and contextual sort of both line up with tertiary. And so essentially what this model looks at is sort of direct effects from a, a spinal cord injury or disability on sexual function. Um, indirect effects are other things related to the disability that can also impact sex. And then iatrogenic are sort of other types of factors, usually surgical based, um, that can impact it. And contextual is sort of all of everything else, which I feel like is a very wide umbrella. Um, so the way that I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this tonight is we're gonna talk about it sort of following this model, but thinking about it more from that circles of sexuality, from a much wider lens. So one of the things that I'd like to start with are sort of some of the indirect things. So one of the things that I do with a lot of um, my patients at the hospital um, is we do a biweekly education group and I give them a handout. And one of the things that in, that's in there is this sort of diagram. It's, on, it's like on a full piece of paper. And so what this is, it's called a sensation map. And so oftentimes after an injury, many people will have absent or decreased sensation below their level of injury, but they also may have heightened sensation above their level of injury. So I talk to people a lot about trying to sort of re-explore what their sensation is and keeping in mind that their sensation can continue to change. Um, and so for many people, I have some patients, if they have sort of lower level injuries or thoracic level injuries, sometimes their nipples may become super sensitive. Um, for some of my patients that have cervical level injuries, sometimes the neck, the jaw, the ears may become much more sensitive, may become new hot spots. Um, and I often talk to people too, that for many times, part of this is sort of relearning your body, but it's also your partner learning your body, especially if it's someone that you have been with for a very long time. Um, I sometimes find that like, People will go to please you in all the same ways that they've pleased you before, um, but your response to that may be different. And so keeping that in mind, so this is an activity, um, this um, sort of map down here, it's called a sensation map. Um, and it's actually a sort of, it's a therapeutic technique that's used in couples therapy. Um, it's called body mapping. Um, and really what it is, it's using, it's a tool to sort of talk to your partner about what things feel really good. And so I think about this, particularly um, following a spinal cord injury, about what areas feel really good? What areas can I feel in? Um, and then also what type of touch feels really good? So I have some patients that say like a really deep touch feels great, like almost like a deep massage. Um, I have other people who are like a deep massage is painful, but like a light touch feels very nice. Um, and so I encourage people, you can sort of use a sensation map in a few different ways. Um, so one of them would be coloring it in sort of like a traffic light. If you have any areas that are painful or hurt you, color those areas in red, sort of try to avoid this area. Areas that maybe you're not really sure of what that sensation is, color those in yellow, sort of proceed with caution. Areas that maybe feel really good, color those areas in green. Um, I've also had people that will sort of write in if they like, like a deeper touch. Um, I've had some patients that have incision lines from surgeries that are really sensitive still. And so they wanna try to avoid those areas. Um, and again, the whole goal of, of 
doing sensation mapping is really just to communicate with your partner about what feels good so that your partner can then work on pleasing you in a way that feels really good for you. Um, one of the other things um, that we talk about a lot is movement and positioning. Um, and so one of the, the ways, so I don't know if any of you guys use these when you were in rehab, we have at McGee, we have these wedge pillows that we'll put under people when they sleep. So we sort of turn them to a side and we put the wedge behind them. Um, there are wedge pillows that exist for different sexual positions. I actually have, this is my handout that I use, I have it laminated. So I don't know, I hope there's not like a glare on it. Um, so this is one of the ones that we use. So this is called the Liberator. And I'll actually show this to you guys later. I have it here. Uh, but you can see there's like different, I'm going to try and like zoom. I feel like you're just going to see the screen. Um, <laughs> these have different types of different positions that give you, again, just different options. I find that many of um, folks, many of the folks that I've talked to that are sort of years out from their injury often say like, I feel like I just lay there. I don't feel like I'm an active participant in sex the way that I used to be. Um, and so for many people, it's sort of knowing, okay, what's out there? These ramp wedge pillows can be really expensive, but like, do you have lots of pillows in your house? Like you can also do similar things with other types of pillows. Um, and so I think some of it is sort of knowing what's out there, knowing what's possible, um, and then sort of knowing your body. So and one of the things that I do um, at McGee is I do what are called co-treatment sessions where I will work with a physical therapist or an occupational therapist um, and we'll actually take the ramp pillows and the, the things every, I'll take all the stuff I'll show you guys in a little bit into the patient's room and have them try it. So have them get into the different positions. Um, and there's is a video that I show and I'm going to try to see if I can pull this up for you guys. Okay. All right. So I'm hoping you guys can see this. So this is a website. It's called sexualitysci.org. Um, it is a wonderful website. Um, it's from uh, Mount Sinai Hospital. And so they redid this recently and it has probably like seven or eight um, videos, but it talks about a lot about some of the different positioning options. I'm going to play just a minute or two of this. Um, please type in the chat if for some reason you can't hear this. You guys, I'm hoping you can hear that. Let's see, I'm gonna give it like another 10 seconds to buffer. Like it only gives us a minute at a time. There we go. So this is the liberator wedge. See this. You can see her ankles have cuffs on them um, that help keep her legs together. This, you can kind of see it. There's a little vibrator here. 
Oop, sorry. Technical difficulties. Pause that there. Okay. Um, and so that I feel like is a really good video because I feel like sometimes people are like, oh, well, what does that look like? How would that look like for me? And I feel like those videos do a really good job of showing you sort of all of the different options again, so that there you have some variety and you have some ideas to say, oh, maybe that would work for me or, oh, I would never do that. Like some of those are very acrobatic positions. So just be prepared. Um, one of the other things that I talk to people about, particularly when it comes to movement, is thinking about your fatigue and sort of what your strength is. So some of the positions, so um, for example, some of these positions that are sort of like a modified doggy style, um, some of those require a lot of upper body strength. And I find that many of my patients are able, at least initially when they do it, um, they're able to get into the position, but you can't stay in that very long. It takes a lot of upper body strength to be able to hold yourself up for that long. As you continue to get stronger, then those positions will become easier. But I often talk to people about preparing that like, you're not gonna be in just one position the whole time. You're probably gonna have to switch positions. Um, and so just knowing that and sort of planning for that can be helpful. Uh, one of the other things we talk about as well is bowel and bladder function. Um, so really just talking to people about how they're managing their bowel and bladder. Um, so for folks with um, vaginas, if you have a Foley catheter or an indwelling catheter, um, you can um, have sex with that in. Usually what you do is just sort of tape it off to the side. Um, for folks with penises, you can bend the Foley catheter over the penis, um, that wouldn't be an issue. Um, if you are intermittent cathing, usually what we recommend is that you cath yourself right before sex. So um, even if it's only been two hours, try to cath yourself. Essentially what happens is when you lay down, your bladder tends to relax. Um, and if somebody's on top of you, they could be putting pressure on your bladder, which could also cause your bladder to empty. Um, one of the other things uh, that I talk to people about, and this is sort of in more in the demonstration, but this is it's hard to see a little bit. So this is called the Liberator Fascinator Throw. It is very large. I can't, I don't even know if my screen is large enough to hold it all in there. Um, it is a throw that is fluid absorbent. And so it's sort of like chucks or the bed pads, um, but they come in like 30 different colors. It's velvety, it's soft, um, and, you, and it can be thrown in the washer um, after sex. So if you do leak a little bit or if it's something that you're concerned about, um, it's something that sort of still feels sexy without necessarily feeling like chucks or bed pads. Um, the other thing I talked about people talk to about a lot as well um, is spasticity. And I say spasticity is sort of like marriage vows. It's sort of for better or for worse. Um, I have had some patients whose spasms are really, really painful and uncomfortable. Um, I had one young lady that we worked with who was really worried that um, her legs would spasm and almost like lock up. Um, and she was really worried that when she was having sex with her boyfriend, he was gonna get stuck in there. Um, and so what we did was figure out sort of what positions she could be in. And what we found is that if the head of the bed was 30 degrees or higher, she was fine, no spasms. If the head of the bed was lower, she was laying flat, then she had the spasms. Um, and so we talked about sort of sideline positions, other different types of positions that would help minimize some of those spasms that were getting triggered by what position she was in. Um, some people will also take their anti-spasticity medication prior to having sex, just so again, their spasms are lower or less. Um, I've also had people learn how to use their spasms to their benefit. So I've had some patients that will get spasms in their legs. Um, and what they do is if they learn like what can trigger them, sometimes it makes it easier to switch in and out of different positions in their bed. Um, I also had a patient who had a higher cervical level injury who couldn't move his arms, but if his elbow was propped up his um, like his arm would spasm. And so his wife would lay across him and they would prop his elbow up and he would use that to sort of manually pleasure her. Um, he would sometimes attach a vibrator to his hand. Again, it just sort of gave them different options. 
And part of that, I think, is sort of as you sort of know your body and sort of you're going to know what things are going to feel good and what things are not going to feel good. And if your spasms are painful or disruptive or really make it make you uncomfortable, then you're going to want to do things to try to lessen those. Um, I even talk to people like even if you're if you have pain, um, same thing is true for pain. Um, if your pain really interferes with sex, then try to figure out a time of day when your pain is a little bit less or take your pain meds before you have sex. Those are the types of things that you can sort of do to make sure that like your body is ready and prepared and in the mood when you do have sex. Um, some of the other um, things that I will typically go through um, are some of the side effects of medications. There are many, many medications that have sexual side effects. So these are the big four, um, antidepressants, heart medications, certain antispasticity meds, and certain high blood pressure meds. And so they can affect drive, libido, as well as your sexual function. And so one of the things that I like to talk to people about is really to encourage them as much as possible if you feel like I just don't have the desire to have sex. I don't, I'm, it's not there anymore. Um, talk to your doctor about your meds. It might be something as simple as switching a medication. I think many times people sort of internalize that and say, oh, there must be something wrong with me. And I'm like, you know, it's just your meds. Like just switch your meds. It'll help. Um, other things I talk to people about as well is autonomic dysreflexia. So anybody whose injury level is a T6 level or higher is at risk for autonomic dysreflexia. So we talk a lot about this, about sort of the things that can cause you to become dysreflexic. And so usually it's bowel, bladder, and skin, but it's also sex. Um, and so the big things, I usually say the thing that differentiates sex is that for most people, you may not be aware if your shoes are tied too tight. You may not be aware if you're constipated. You may not be aware if your foley is caked. You should be aware and alert and awake when you're having sex. So that's the one big thing, but usually what I tell people is if you start to get dysreflexic during sex, if you feel your blood pressure um, rising, you get that sort of quick onset pounding headache, usually switch positions, switch to an activity that's less intense, sort of allow your blood pressure to come back down. Other things, psychologically, um, as people adjust, so depending sort of where you are um, on this journey, sometimes I find that people adjust and sort of sometimes if you have depression, um, that can also dampen um, your sort of sex drive and what things you're interested in. So what we'll talk about next are some of the direct effects. So this is really looking at the direct effects on sexual function. Um, so there are two parts of the spinal cord that control sort of sexual function. And so the first part is in the T10 through L2, which is sort of like right in the middle of the back. And that controls psychogenic function. So that's you see something, you smell something, you taste something, the brain sends a message down through the spinal cord, you respond to that. Um, and for folks with penises, that's usually getting an erect penis. Um, for folks with vaginas, that's usually sort of lubrication and lubricating. The other part of the spinal cord that controls sexual function is the S2 to S4, which is the very bottom, the sacral part of the spinal cord. And that controls what we call reflex function. And so that's you touch yourself, your partner touches you. Um, I've had people like if they have people that are caregivers, like when their caregivers are washing them up, they may get an erection. Um, and sometimes some of that is really just related to your body just responding to being touched. So depending where on the, where in the spinal cord your injury is, you may be able to have sexual function from one or both of those areas. So I encourage people to explore things, to sort of see what your response is, to see sort of what that looks like um, for you. Um, and then to sort of, we'll talk some, a little bit on the next slide about some of the different treatment options that are out there. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, so for folks with penises. So one of the other things, in addition to erections, that same area controls ejaculation. And so the T10 through L2 controls emission. So that's where the sperm sort of leaves the testicles and goes to the bottom of the penis. The S2 to S4, the very bottom of the spinal cord controls the ejaculation of it coming out of the penis. And so one of the things that can happen after a spinal cord injury is something called retrograde ejaculation. And that's where emission happens, but ejaculation doesn't. So the sperm sort of leaves the testicles and goes to the bottom of the penis, but there's nothing to push it out. Now inside the penis, there's the urethra is sort of like a train track. So part of it goes down and connects down into your bladder. The other part connects down into your testicles. And so one of the things that happens in retrograde ejaculation is once that sperm comes to the bottom of the penis, that train track sort of flips over 
and the sperm goes down into your bladder. The next time that you cath yourself or the next time that you go to the bathroom, it'll come out with your urine. It's not painful. It doesn't hurt you in any way. It's your body sort of natural mechanism to make sure that those tracks are staying clear. Um, and so, for example, I've had patients, I had one um, patient who regularly masturbated before bed. It was part of what he did. It helped him relax and fall asleep. Um, and he would be waking up at midnight to cath himself and his urine was really cloudy. And he was like, doctor, I got a urinary tract infection. Turns out, no, he was just um, having retrograde ejaculation. And so it's something I think that's important to know. Um, so I've had people who are like, I felt like I like came, but nothing came out. Um, and so then I would just tell people like, look the next time that you cath yourself to see like, is it, you know, is it cloudy? What does it look like? Cause sometimes that can explain it. Um, one of the other things that I talk about as well is fertility. Um, and so that can be one of the other direct effects. So, um, for folks with vaginas and with uteruses, fertility is totally still intact. Um, um, some of the things are, there are some questions about pregnancy. It used to be thought that all women with spinal cord injuries that got pregnant had sort of automatically high risk pregnancies, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, but there are some special things that they will keep an eye on as the pregnancy progresses, such as learning what the signs of labor are, um, keeping in mind how you're doing transfers, your balance, weight gain, and sort of how your wheelchair fits. There's lots of different things that they will look at as you um, sort of go through your pregnancy. Um, for men, the biggest thing oftentimes is the sperm's motility. And so that really means like how well the sperm are able to swim. So there's some really good research out of the um, Miami Dade Clinic um, down in Miami um, that looks at male sexual function and fertility um, following spinal cord injury. And what they have found is that usually within a few hours to a few days after an injury, so this is a new injury, not necessarily a disorder, there are inflammatory proteins that appear in the fluid around the sperm that damage the sperm's ability to swim. They have since done some really good research and they have found that probenicid, which is a medication for gout, um, can be given that actually temporarily can increase the number of sperm that are able to swim. So for example, before your injury, if you ejaculated, there may be 100,000 sperm that could swim. This is just an example. After the injury, you may have 40,000. But once you take that medication, it could go up to 60,000, which really just increases your chances of conceiving. Um, and they found that that medication, probenicid, when taken, I believe, for four weeks, um, at the end of that, they saw an increase in the number of sperm that were able to swim and able to swim well, um, and that that sustained itself for about six weeks. Um, and I don't know if they have done follow-up studies to see if it lasts longer than that, but know that that is an option that's out there. Um, those are some of the things that sort of go into some of the questions and concerns people have about fertility of, can I even have kids? Um, there are also fertility clinics and special urologists um, that can also help as well with um, ejaculation um, and the ability if you're having difficulties in conceiving naturally. All right, so treatments for erectile dysfunction. So the first thing that I usually talk about is education. You have to know sort of how your penis works to be able to figure out how you can fix it and what you can do. One of the other things I will talk to people about as well are vacuum pumps. So there are a few different kinds of them. So this is a sort of hand pump. I hope you can hear that. So the penis goes here in the bottom and then you pump it up. I'm gonna do this right here on the table that I'm at and you're gonna be able to hear it when I pull it off. So you ready? Do you hear that? So obviously you don't wanna do that and like tear that off your skin. So what you would do is you would pump it up. All of them come with a button that you can release it and it releases the pressure and you take it off. So essentially you can use this if you have difficulty getting hard at all. Um, how it works is sort of inside of the penis and the shaft of the penis, there's two spongy bodies of tissue. And so what happens when you get hard is blood fills up those spongy bodies of tissue and how the pumps work is sort of like if you've ever given anyone a hickey and you suck on their neck, you sort of pull blood to the surface. And that's all that the pumps do is pull blood to the surface. There are, so that one, the one I just showed you is a very basic one. You have to have pretty good hand strength to sort of push the balloon or have somebody to help you do that. Um, this one is one, those you can buy at any sex toy store. This is a battery operated one, okay? And you can see it's got two buttons on it, okay? Same process, just pushing the button. 
you can pop that. You can see like the mark that it leaves on my hand. And then the same thing, it also has a release button. So you can release it and release the, the pressure. So the upside of these, um, the one I just showed you, the battery operated one doesn't require as much hand function to be able to use, um, but it is a little bit more expensive. So you can buy them from medical supply stores. Um, the last I checked, they were around 140 to $180, um, but they work fairly, fairly easily. The upside of those is that they're external to you. So there's very little risk of side effects. Um, now, one of the things that happens with the pumps is that sometimes the pumps will cause an erection, but they won't help you keep an erection. So sometimes people will report that they lose their erection, the erection isn't as hard as it used to be, it may take a lot of mental focus in order to keep an erection. So there's, again, a few different things. So one of the things that we'll often recommend using in conjunction um, with the vacuum pumps are tension rings or cock rings. So these come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, so this is one called, you can see my old like beat up little box here. It's called a rec cell. Um, and so this is one that has, it's sort of like, it's almost like a zipper um, and it has tiny little tabs on it. So depending on what your hand function is, it's a little bit easier to open. Again, they come in different shapes and sizes. Um, these are fairly easy to find. They're maybe five or 10 bucks. They're not super expensive. Um, you can clean most of them with soap and water and reuse them. There are other ones. So this one is one that like if you have this type of grasp, you can grasp it this way. Um, this is one, good, I'm wearing black, you can see this. This is one that you can sort of get your fingers in and pull. Um, and then this is one, this is sort of a newer one. Um, this is, feels a little bit different. It's sort of softer. Um, some of these other ones are a little bit more sort of sticky. Um, and so this one is a little bit softer, a little bit smoother. So these will help you essentially just keep an erection. So if you can get hard, but it doesn't stay hard, you can just use the, the tension ring. Um, again, you can buy these at any sex toy store. You can buy them Target, Walmart, Walgreens sells them. Um, Trojan makes one that has a tiny little vibrator on top of it. Um, and they're fairly easy to use. If, you're going, if you have difficulties getting hard and then staying hard, you can use the pump along with the ring. So usually what I recommend to people is to put the ring on the bottom of the pump. I don't know if you can see that here. And then you essentially would get fully hard and you just pull it off and then it's right on the bottom. And so these rings go on the bottom of the penis, sort of right where the penis is touching the body they can stay on for about 30 to 40 minutes at a time. And then you're gonna to wanna to take it off to allow the blood to sort of flow back out of the penis. Um, I think that's it for that. Um, other things that people will try, and usually most people will jump right to the oral medications. Um, so there are four different types of medications. So I'm sure you guys know some of these. So Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and Stendra. So all of them work fairly similarly. You take the pill, you have to wait about 30 to 60 minutes prior to having sex, and you need to be manually stimulated, meaning you need to touch yourself or your partner needs to touch you in order for the medication to start working. Um, the Side effects and the risks of them. Um, one of the side effects is priapism, which is an erection that lasts more than four hours. What do you do if that happens? You go to the ER, you call the doctor. I ask patients that in our class and they're like, keep going. And I'm like, four hours is a really long time. Um, so essentially what can happen is essentially you wanna make sure essentially again, that the blood is flowing back out of the penis. Um, I find that most patients, when they try the medications, they usually have to adjust the meds at least two to three times until you find a good dose. So I always tell people when you go into it, don't expect the first time you use it, the first pill, it's going to work magically. Um, sometimes it takes sort of adjusting it, changing the dose a little bit until you get exactly what works so that you can sort of have something that you know will work consistently for you. Um, some of the other things that are options are urethral suppositories. So there's one called Muse, M-U-S-E, um, that is prescribed typically by a urologist. It is a tiny suppository. It's no bigger than a catheter that gets inserted into the penis. And there's a tiny pouch of medication that you can push on to dispense the medication. 
Um, the upside of the suppositories is that they work fairly quickly. They work in about 10 to 15 minutes, whereas compared to like Viagra or Cialis, where you have to be like, all right, we're leaving dinner at six o'clock. It's going to take us 20 minutes to get home, 10 minutes to get my clothes off. I should take that now, or I'll take it in the car so I can get hard right when I want to. Um, the urethral suppositories give you a little bit more spontaneity, um, but you can have sex fairly quickly after you use them. Um, the other upside is that you can also use them twice in any 24 hour period. So if you wanna have sex more frequently, again, that's another good option. Um, there are also intracavernocial injections. So that are, those are injections that go directly into the penis. Um, and so those are also prescribed by a urologist. Um, there is a risk for priapism. So they wanna sort of, what they'll do is they bring you in the office and they trial them in the office to figure out exactly what dose would work for you. Um, and they also teach you sort of how to change the site of the injection. Um, if you get any type of injection over and over in the same spot, it can cause bruising and scarring of the tissue. So you wanna make sure that you sort of, they teach you how to divide the penis usually into quadrants and you sort of change and you rotate the site of where you give yourself the injection. There are also penile prostheses. Um, so there are two different types. So there is a semi-adjustable rod, which is, I liken it sort of to like a straw. If you bend it up when you want it, you bend it down when you don't. Um, there's also one that has, that takes those spongy bodies of tissue and replaces them with inflatable balloons. And there's sort of a button underneath your skin that you can sort of push and the balloons inflate. You push it again, they deflate. Um, those typically, obviously, that requires a surgery and involves surgery, um, and those often need to be replaced every 10 to 15 years, depending on sort of which model or what you get. Um, there are also people who say, I have too many side effects from some of these, and they look at other devices like strap-ons um, that they can use to have sex with their partner or to please their partner. All right, so for ejaculatory dysfunction, so again, um, the big things that I always start with is education. So try things out. I often have people tell me it takes them significantly longer to get to the point of ejaculating. The other thing that I think is really important, I've presented across the country and I've had so many people come up to me and tell me I wasn't able to ejaculate right after I was injured. Eight years later, I had one guy tell me, I think it was 12 years after his injury, he was suddenly able to ejaculate again. And so keep in mind that like this is stuff that can continue to change. And so um, I have people that are say like, yes, I want to ejaculate, but no, I'm not interested in kids. Um, and so really then we would look at the penile vibratory stimulation or PVS. And so there's two different kinds. So this is the Furticare model. Um, this is sort of the original model that came out. This sort of tab right here provides a very high frequency vibrator. And it's applied to the underside of the head of the penis, which is where the most nerve endings are. There's about 4,000 nerve endings there. And when it's applied there, it essentially triggers that reflex in the S2 to S4 part of the spinal cord. The way that I think about it is like, if you've ever sat on a, like on a, I don't know, an exam table and you had the doctor, like they hit your knee with that little like hammer thing. And then your foot kicks out. It's sort of like that, except the vibration is sort of hitting your penis and then causing the ejaculation to come out. Um, so that is the Furticare one. The other one, this is the Vibrect. Um, and so there's two different models. I actually have them that I can show you. And so I got these, we were, McGee was lucky enough, we had a donor um, who actually donated funds that we could purchase these. So this is the Furticare, okay? And you can see sort of this is the pad. And then down here at the bottom, it's probably pretty hard to see, but this is the amplitude of the frequency. So I'm gonna turn this on, it'll be a little loud. And you can sort of hear what that sounds like. Um, this one is significantly more expensive. This one was around $800. I just bought them online. I didn't need a script or anything. Um, the other one, this is the, whoop, this is the Vibrect model. So this, uh, this always reminds me of a hair straightener and I like can't get the image out of my head. But for this, the head of the penis again goes in between here. You can see on here, there is a frequency or sort of plus and minus as a way to change the amplitude. Um, you can push this button to take the pads out if you want to change those out power and then if it's charging. And this one is only if you move the bottom part that you'll feel some of that vibration. Okay, and again, you hear how loud that is. Um, so no, this one is significantly cheaper. It's probably around $300. I think it was like 280 when I got it, but I think the price has gone up to around 300. Um, again, something you can just buy 
um, at a online. Um, you don't need a, anything. The upsides of the vibrators are that you can use them at home. Um, and so I've had people that are like, I don't know, no interest in having kids, but I like to see myself ejaculate regularly. And they buy them just to trigger ejaculation. Um, that is also currently the best practice method for retrieving sperm um, through a fertility clinic. So even if you go into a fertility clinic, that's likely what they'll use. And then they may use intrauterine insemination to impregnate your partner. Um, all right, I am running low on time. So I'm gonna go through some of this stuff fairly quickly. Um, rectal probe electroejaculation is a probe that's inserted into the anus that provides electrical stimulation and triggers ejaculation. Needle aspiration is where they go directly into the testicles and sort of siphon the sperm out. Um, and also an important reminder that orgasm and ejaculation are not the same thing. For most folks with penises, those two things have happened together for all of their lives, but they're two separate things. Ejaculation is the sperm coming out of the penis. Orgasm is sort of those waves of sensation, the pleasure, the sort of sense of release that you get um, when you have an orgasm. Okay. Um, for decreased lubrication, um, for folks with vulvas, usually I will tell people the best thing, one is it's very, it's a much simpler fix compared to all the pumps and gadgets and gizmos for folks with penises. Um, usually it's just over-the-counter lubricants. I do recommend avoiding warming or tingling lubricants, particularly if you don't have great sensation as you may not feel when, um, if you start to have a reaction to them. Um, if you're having sex with condoms, um, water-based or silicone-based work best compared to oil-based. Um, and there is a um, really great blog called, um, from Smitten Kitten, it's called badvibes.org, that just talks a little bit about different types of lubricants that are out there. Um, for folks who are um, going through menopause or have gone through menopause and also have vaginal dryness, oftentimes you can talk to your OBGYN about um, oestrogen creams as well that can help improve some of that. Um, some of the other things I think about when we're thinking about sex and sort of what are barriers, um, sort of relationship status of like your relationship didn't exist in a vacuum. Very few people ever have perfect relationships. And so um, sometimes I find that people have a challenge in adjusting to that. Um, thinking about just physically, what is your setup at home? Some people go home and they don't have access necessarily to their own bedroom where they have privacy. Um, I have two young kids, so I also know, like, I have kids all the time, you know, like, my kids are everywhere, so thinking about that and just knowing sort of your privacy, um, your beliefs and values will also influence sort of sexuality and how you feel about it, um, and then also some of the things at the bottom, so your race, your religion, your orientation, your gender identity, all of those things can sort of contribute to how you conceptualize sex and sort of what sex and intimacy looks like in your life. Um, so dating and relationships. So I'm going to, again, sort of try to breeze through this. So I find that oftentimes for people that are looking for new relationships, they often have questions about sort of how do I find someone if they're doing either online dating or regular dating, what do I share? When do I share that about my injury? How much do I share? Um, and the general advice I give people is usually how do I find someone? And I say, you know, many of the ways that you would have found someone before. Um, so do you go to sporting events? Do you go to church? Um, do you, you know, where, where else do you go to, to, to meet people? Do you go out a lot? Um, and so thinking about those things, I also have a lot of people that do online dating. I've had several people that have two different profiles. Um, one that they maybe don't necessarily share their injury right away. And one maybe that does. Um, and really, I think part of that is sort of reflecting on what you feel most comfortable with, um, to then be able to share, um, and then as far as how much you share and when, um, oftentimes I say like some of it, I think you can address sort of from, you know, what you, based on what you feel comfortable with. Um, but I also say too, like if people have questions, then you answer just that question. I think sometimes you feel, people feel the need to like go on and on and on about something or say how involved it is, but you can answer just that question. Um, for folks in existing relationships, I find that sometimes there's sort of a recalibrating that happens within the relationship and the relationship dynamics. And so some of that is sort of reconnecting, um, sort of rebuilding intimacy of like, what does this mean? Um, and sort of rethinking about what your roles are within the relationship, you know? And so I think about, you know, if you identify as a man or identify as a woman, like what, what about you being a man? Like, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a wife? What does it mean to be a girlfriend? Um, and what does that look like? Um, and so thinking then, okay, if some of my injury changes, 
some of that? How does it change it? What ways am I still able to fulfill that? I think sometimes some of that requires active conversations around. And I think those are sometimes some of the things that people don't necessarily talk about easily. They're hard things to talk about. Um, these are some of the resources um, that I talk about. So sexualitysci.org, that is the videos that I showed you guys. Um, Dr. Mitchell Tepper has a great website as well. That's where this sort of um, clip came from. I need to forewarn you, if you watch this clip, the woman in it is super flexible. She like pretzels her legs behind her head. I, I still have no idea how she does. It's amazing. Um, so keep that in mind. Not everyone is that flexible. Um, the Mayo Clinic has a video called Feeling Your Way, which just talks more about relationships and dating. Um, Sexuality Reborn is a video from, I believe, like 1980. Um, it is pornographic in nature, um, but it follows four or five couples where one or both partners have a disability and just talks about how they have sex and shows them having sex if you're more of like a visual learner. Um, and then FacingDisability.com has really good website, um, really good videos, just short videos that people just talk about dating and sort of what sex is like and what relationships are like for them. Um, here are some written different options as far as books and handouts. Um, again, I will um, make sure that you guys get these if you want them. Um, and then there's also other books. Um, and then I wanted to open it up for some questions. We have about nine minutes left. Um, I also put my email address on here. So I know particularly when it comes to questions, many times people may not feel comfortable sharing questions. Um, so if you do have questions or you want resources or anything, please feel free to email me um, and I can try to, to connect you with um, what you may need or what you may want. Also, I did give everybody permission to speak if there were any questions um, verbally instead of using the chat, but there are both options. Um, and as well, like Trisha said, her contact information can be any questions outside of the webinar.